So first, what is H5P? H5P is a tool that can be used to create interactive questions. So in using H5P, you can create questions in many different places. So if you're based at UBC, you can use the UBC Open Hub linked here. The same slide, these slides, by the way, are shared online right now. So any of these links are active if you want to um, be following along or clicking on any of the links. I'll just ask um, either Will or Simon, would you be able to share the link that we had during the keynote to where, where the slides are so that anyone who has access to them can have them? So. You can make H5P content at UBC at this tool. If you are based in BC, but not at UBC, you can use Pressbooks for free and create H5P content there. Um, you can also, if you have your own WordPress, Drupal, or Moodle site, you can install the H5P plugin for free or create using h5p.com, which um, includes a paid service uh, or Lumi. Once you create your H5P content, you can put it anywhere that your course material is or anywhere you want. So you can embed it within Canvas, you can put it in a WordPress site, in a press book if you want to put it within a textbook or any other website that has an HTML editor. So some of the strengths of H5P is that it works really well for formative assessment. So something where students are using it to practice, but it's not necessarily for grades. It can be really flexible, interactive elements. So you can make an interactive element and then put it exactly where you want in your course, rather than having it be like a separate test-like thing, like a Canvas quiz might be. It's really easy to integrate across many platforms. So you could have the same question sitting in many different places. And when you edit it back on the H5P tool, it updates it in all of those places simultaneously, which can be really helpful. And another advantage is that it's really, it's got lots of different question types and it's really easy to share them with other people. I, you are also able to reuse, download, embed other people's content if they choose to share them in that way. And it has opportunities for students to also partake in making some of the questions. It doesn't work as it, it, the UBC instance currently doesn't have a way for you to easily integrate it with grading or analytics that we'll hear on our panel tomorrow about how some people um, get around that and still use it very effectively for graded activities. Um, and the other thing that it doesn't work as well for is if you're in more of a computational science type course, it doesn't work well for computational or formula based questions. It doesn't smartly interpret numbers. So you could have the answer as a number, but it's not going to understand something like scientific notation um, or significant figures or something. So in terms of H5P, there are a ton of different content types. This is just a few of them. If you want to uh, explore any of these later on your own time, these each link to examples of that particular content type. And H5P can work well for displaying content in your course. So for example, the course presentations and course books and timelines and accordions, it can also work really well for formative assessment. So these are more question-based things that ask students to answer a question and they get some form of feedback. In this session um, and in the symposium, we're focusing this time on looking at interactive videos. Now, because interactive videos uh, include putting questions within them, we're also gonna explore little bits of multiple choice questions, fill in the blank, having image um, type hotspots, as well as drag and drop and um, elements of the branching scenario, they all fit within this interactive video. So why might we care about putting in the effort to make an interactive video? Well, we know that active learning is the gold standard and that students learn better and retain the information for longer when they um, have active learning. But as we've included active learning in the classroom, sometimes we end up taking some of the content from the course and moving it outside the course into a video to make room for more active learning in the classroom. But then some of these videos will just mimic the passive style that we're trying to avoid in the classroom in the first place. So we know too that watching a traditional video can sometimes even lead to worse performance just than a textbook. So what the goal of these interactive videos then is to bring some of the active learning back in when we're watching videos um, and to be able to have students have checks in their knowledge, to have support of checking whether they're understanding something and also to increase their motivation to be paying attention to the video and help, um, and help them ultimately get more learning and longer retention out of it. So I wanted to show you some use case scenarios of when we have found interactive videos helpful in our courses. So I'm just going to um, pull those up. 
So the first one here is showing how interactive videos can be embedded right into your course. So for example, this is a, a textbook um, for first year psychology, the OpenStax textbook um, on Pressbooks that Simon has taken the OpenStax textbook and he has added in H5P elements. So if you take the textbook and you get down here, you see that there is now an interactive video um, that is integrated in. This is our first year textbook in chemistry at UBC. And again, we have this interactive video down here that I'll, I'll show you in a moment. And the letters on either side. This is generally true of IUPAC names. Letters and numbers are separated by dashes. For ease of pronunciation, you will often see this name written as 3-heptanol. I'm pausing the video here for a moment. So what you're going to see in a moment is the interactive part coming in. So the idea of this video, to give you some context, is that our students in first year chemistry come in where some of them have done lots of organic nomenclature in high school. And some of them have no idea what organic nomenclature is. And we have one lecture to cover all of organic nomenclature. So the idea of this interactive video is to give students a tutorial before they come to lecture that gets them all up to a similar sort of level on what we expect that what we were hoping that they would know from high school. So students who uh, know the information well can move through the video quite quickly. And those who don't, it's kind of holding their hand and scaffolding them through to help them get up to a similar level. So you're going to see that in a moment of what that looks like in this context. Let's try another one. Select the suffix for this molecule. So the video is asking them to build up the name of this molecule. So it's, they're given this chart and they need to select what is the suffix. It's built on invisible hotspots. So they might select here. Well, this molecule is a hydrocarbon. It also has at least one other functional group with higher priority. Select the suffix associated with the highest priority functional group. So the student has received some feedback on why their incorrect answer was incorrect and asked to try again. Correct. The alcohol is the highest priority functional group, so the suffix is OL. What is the prefix for this molecule? So this video co uh, continues on, and as they're naming these molecules, it's taking them through step by step each piece of naming a molecule. But instead of just telling them the answer, it's asking them to do each step. So they are the ones building the name of the molecules and they're given feedback and scaffolding and support as they need it, rather than as a default, just going through as a worked example. So another example that I'll show you uh, is in the context of after lecture, once they've already seen things or once they've already read in the textbook is back at Simon's um, example here in his textbook. I'm gonna show you a little bit longer about this video because we're going to be recreating a little bit of it later to see the mechanics of how these work. So I will um, will show you the first maybe minute or two of this video. Uh, hey doc, your EEG um, e -E machine thingy is beeping. What does this mean? Okay, so you're seeing here a bit of a different style where the question instead of being, instead of everything being built within the video and having those invisible hotspots, now what we have is over here a question that is overlaid on top of the video. So the question is still asked within the video, but we're giving our answers as these buttons on the side. So, but just like the first video, if we give an incorrect answer, it's going to branch to a part that gives student information on just what they need. When we're awake and alert, our brains exhibit beta waves. In stage one of sleep, we would expect to see alpha waves, which are lower in frequency and higher in amplitude than beta waves. As the patient continued in stage one, we would also expect to see theta waves, which are even lower in frequency and somewhat higher in amplitude. In the EEG that Preston showed, the patient does seem to exhibit theta waves, but there's also a burst of high frequency, high amplitude activity that is not consistent with stage one sleep. 
which stage of sleep involves theta waves as well as brief bursts of electrical activity. Okay, so again, students had some feedback on why their answer is incorrect and asked to try again. And if they get the correct answer, the video will, we'll see, give a little... Okay, stage two. Why? Okay, so now they're asked to continue on with their answer. Um, and there's several questions, as you can see by each of the little dots down here. Another example of, um, of when we might use an interactive video is something like uh, within my course, one of the courses that I teach in first year chemistry at UBC, students find substitution reactions a complex thing to work through. And so when we send them home to do their first um, examples uh, or first questions, they often would struggle to do that on their own. So a, a video like the one I'm about to show you can add some scaffolding where they are guided through their first question rather than having to do it all from scratch, but it's asking them to do much more than just watching a worked example. Carbon. Select the correct curved arrow, the red arrow or the blue arrow. So I'm going to select the incorrect one. The red arrow shows the direction that the carbon cation moves, but curved arrows should represent the movement of the electrons, not atoms. The blue arrow correctly shows that the electrons from the oxygen are shared with a positively charged carbon. Since the reacting nucleophile and carbon cation have a net positive charge, the product of this reaction here should also have a positive charge. Select the atom that bears the formal positive charge. Okay, so and this question would continue on. So you can see here that because these questions are involving molecules and drawings and stuff, and it's a little more complex, again, we've used the the hot spots that are invisible within the video rather than using the text-based questions like we did for the previous example. Now, the videos that I've shown you so far were fairly labor intensive to make because they are very specifically made um, with interactivity in mind and have different branches, but they are also quite um, effective for our students. But interactive videos don't necessarily need to be that complex. Here's an example of a video that I got off of YouTube and added interactivity to within a couple of minutes. So the first thing that I did was I took the video and I added some guiding questions that I might want to give to my students. Um, for example, what is the full chemical reaction? Why uh, is this reaction endothermic or exothermic? And why? What is the change in entropy? Um, and click play when you are ready. I'm just going to adjust the size here. All right, guys, so today I'm going to show you a combustion reaction. So this week we've been talking about combustion reactions a whole lot, and I've been explaining constantly that they release a lot of heat, but I think you need to see it to fully understand it. So what I have here is isopropyl alcohol, and that is a hydrocarbon. So that's the first piece. So they could click here and see a little bit more about what that isopropyl alcohol is. ...that we need for a combustion reaction. Oh no, it's, I've so already done the question. It, <laughs> I'm, gonna vaporize. So I'm just going to cap it and I'm going to vaporize it. So, so I'm just going to cap it and I'm going to vape the first piece that we need for a combustion reaction. It's noting that I've already done the question and got it right because um, I did it just before. So you can see though, it's popped up with a question and it's asked, well, what is the other reagent? And depending on what they picked, it would give them text-based feedback for any um, answer that they gave. And if it was incorrect, they, it would ask them again just within this same text-based um, question, and then they could continue on to the rest of the video. At the end, there's some more questions that reflect back on those, so the I'm initial guiding questions. It, and just I'm gonna vaporize it, so I'm gonna get all the liquid to turn. Okay, so let me bring back our questions. Okay, so we've looked at each of these different examples and when they might be useful in class, so maybe looking at applications from videos you find, worked examples for helping with tricky questions, um, practice like the sleep machine video, a pre-lecture video like the nomenclature one. In terms of what students find when they use these videos, Simon and I have also done a number of studies on these specific videos that you've seen as well as others. And I'm gonna tell you briefly about some of them just to motivate my, why we might wanna bother putting in the time to make interactive videos. And Simon, as I mentioned, will be going into these studies in more detail is in the, uh, in the feedback talk tomorrow. So the general study for the general procedure for our studies one to three was that we took students and they were randomly assigned to watch either to the traditional or interactive version of the video. And then we asked them survey questions about their experience with the video. They then 
were shown that there were actually two different versions of the video that they that were available and they got to watch both of them or clips of both of them and then they were asked to answer survey questions about each of the videos now having seen both of them as well as comparing them and so what we have here is students ranking what they thought of the videos that they watched from strongly disagree one to strongly agree seven. And this is before they knew that a second video existed. So they're ranking just based on the video that they saw. So in blue, you'll see students who saw the traditional video and only knew that existed. And in green, you'll see the interactive video who only knew that one existed. So in terms of do you, did the video help them better understand the material, you, you see that both um, are saying that yes, it is. But all of the differences you're going to see are statistically significant here with P's less than 0 0.001 and the numbers at the top are the Cohen's D reported. So we, um, Simon will talk a little bit more in detail about this um, in later sessions. So you can see that students in the inter watching the interactive video felt like they were be better able to understand the material. They found it more enjoyable. They thought the videos were more effective. They felt like they had more control of the pacing over the video and they felt like the pacing of the video was more appropriate. And this next one to me is especially important that they felt like they were able to master a concept before the video moved on to the next one. So at this point, we revealed to students there's actually two different versions and we showed them both and we asked them to rank uh, to rate each of them individually from strongly disagree as one to strongly agree as five. So you can see that students were ranking consistently these interactive videos as more effective, more enjoyable, more engaging and their preferred way to learn with these um, large effect sizes shown at the top. If we ask students which one they would they would choose if they had both available, uh, we saw over on the left here is a strong preference for the interactive version and over on the right is a strong pre preference for the non-interactive or traditional. And you can see that we have a very strong preference uh, for the interactive video, both in terms of what they prefer to learn from, what they found more enjoyable, more engaging, um, and also more effective, both for, for two different studies that they looked at. The different colors here are based on what type of video they watched initially. Okay, so if we look at what some of the students said, if we ask them, well, what do you like about the interactive ones? For those who are saying they prefer that, why did you like it? They said that when they were forced to interact, I am able to take more risks and therefore learn more from the material being presented because it helps me stay engaged. It helps me learn better and more efficiently. It gives me some motivation to pay attention, whereas a non-interactive video gives me a higher chance to zone out. And it pr promotes, I, I appreciate the honesty of this last student who says, it promotes ac active listening, gives me free practice. And when the video solves the question for me immediately, it discourages me from actually doing the work because I'm lazy, which lessens my understanding. So we can see that this, um, that this, these interactive videos, students are preferring, they're finding effective, um, in terms of their experience, um, and they think that it is helping them stay more focused and engaged. So what we're going to do next is then try to make some of these videos. So depending on where you're joining us from, um, you can try making some of the H5 key content that I'm going to show you along with me if you want to. If you um, would prefer, you can watch me work through it or you can do it with me. If you are at UBC, you can use this link right here um, and log in with your CWL. Um, so that's h5p.open.ubc.ca. Um, there's a little tutorial on how to get in there if you struggle. And if you are not at UBC, then you can go to h5p.com and sign up for a free trial there to be able to follow along now. And there are also then free ways, depending on where you're at in the world, that you could that you could be also using H5P for free, um, but they'd take a little bit longer to set up right now. So if you'd like to follow along and try using H5P right now, go ahead and um, access via one of these two ways. Um, I'm gonna go on via the UBC H5P Open Hub and be leading you along there. And if you have any trouble with accessing anything, you can let us know in the chat um, and somebody will help you out. And uh, I'm going, in a moment, when we go through, you'll see that on the slides, if you're, if you're following along on the slides that were posted, you'll be able to follow what I'm doing in case you've missed a step. I have posted them there, but I'm going to be going through them one by one. So first, I'm going to be getting on to the H5P Open Hub. 
So once you get to h5p.open.ubc.ca, you can log in with your CWL if you are at UBC, and otherwise you can go make your free account at h5p.com. Okay, so when you log in, it first takes you to um, making this profile. You can update your profile, pick your faculty um, the first time that you're logging in, and that's the only time that you need to do it. Then on the top left here, you can see that there is the H5P content. So um, we're going to be adding a new content type here. I'm going to give you a minute just to all get to this point where you're in H5P if you'd like to be following along, and I'll show you what we are about to do. There's two different ways you could go about making an interactive video. You could find an existing video, either one that you find that someone else has made or perhaps one you've made previously that you want to add interactivity to, or you can be making a new video where you have interaction intentionally in mind. The first thing that we're going to focus on is the simpler of the two, which is just taking an existing video and adding interactivity on top of what you've already made. So we're going to start with our goal one, which is to use H5P to add multiple choice to a simple YouTube video that we find. So that YouTube video is going to be one that I will um, link in the chat. It's one that I showed as one of the examples. So I'm linking the YouTube video here, which you will need in the chat, which you will need the uh, link for when we're making the video. So I'm heading back over to uh, H5P to be making these and demonstrating it, but you can follow along in the slides if you miss a step um, or if you're wanting to see what it looks like and you're not able to access H5P yourself right now. Okay, so the first thing that we are going to do is come into the H5P environment and click on add new over here. There's also up here where you can add new as well. So either of those will do the same thing. So we're gonna add new and then we need to pick our content type. For me, because I've made a lot of interactive videos, it comes up um, as my recently used. But if it's not coming up for you, you can use this search term to search for interactive video, or you can scroll through. And this is how you'd make any other type of H5P content as well. OK, so then I'm going to click on interactive video, and it's going to open up um, our interactive video. The first thing that we are going to do then is add a title for our video. So this is, uh, we're going to do this is our combustion demo uh, with our interactivity example. You can give it whatever title you want. There's going to be three main steps. You can, um, the first step is going to be that we're going to put down the video that we're going to be building interactivity in. The next step is that we're going to be adding the interactivity. And the third step, the summary task, is like an end of video quiz. And it's optional as to whether you want to include that depending on what you want for your video. So the, the two required steps that we'll be doing are the upload a video and add interactions. So you can add a video by clicking on the little plus here. And then you want to put in the link to the video that you want to put on top. You can link um, any source of an mp4 video for example youtube links work very well and if you are based at ubc you can also use the little tutorial here to be finding what the links are for your kaltura video so that you can host the video on kaltura instead of ubc which gives you or instead of youtube sorry which gives you a bit more um, control over it as well so for this first video we're going to be using the uh, youtube link that I shared in the chat earlier, and it's also shared on the slides. And so you just put it in and click insert. Now, down here, there's a couple things that you could look at if you want to. Um, we're going to skip by them for right now, just to because they're things that we can't do with interactive videos. I'll let you know that what it could let you do is, for example, add a poster as the first kind of slide overlaying your video. Um, and it also would allow you to add some subtitles. Once you've added your video, I'd recommend going into edit copyright and either giving um, credit to wherever you've gotten the video from or setting the copyright if the video belongs to you. So I'm gonna quickly take the time to put the information in here that I'm just gathering from the YouTube video. So this was called Combustion Chemistry Demonstration and the author was Mrs. De Bruin from 2017. And I have just linked the YouTube video again and the license doesn't specify. So on YouTube, that means that it is copyrighted. And then once you've put in whatever the information is, you can just close out of here.
and that will be saved in with the metadata of the question. Okay, so once we've got that, we're gonna go into the spot of adding interactivity. So there's a couple ways you could do that. You could click this button down here that says next step, add interaction, or you can also navigate across the three main buttons up at the top. So I'm gonna click on add interactions at the top and you'll see that it just has this video loaded in from YouTube. So we're gonna try adding in that same question that I showed you when we demonstrated it, the one that I had already answered and so it wasn't letting us see it properly. So we will get to now. So in this video, this um, I, this so seems like perhaps I, so guy, today, oh, in. sorry, it seems like perhaps a high school teacher showing a demonstration of a video. And what we're going to do is add an interactive question in. To show you a combustion reaction, so this is a lot of heat, but I think you need to see it to fully understand it. So what I have here is isopropyl alcohol, and that is a hydrocarbon. So that's the first piece that we need for a combustion reaction. Okay, so she's just put in one thing and said, this is the first piece we need for a combustion reaction. So the question we're going to ask our students, um, because it's not explicitly said in the video for quite a while, is, well, what is the other reactant that I might want to ask my, my students since I um, am in chemistry? So the way that we add interactivity is using this panel across the top. And you'll see there's all different sorts of interactions that you can add. So you can add labels. You can add text, tables, links, images, statements. Uh, a statement is like a, um, it's kind of like a multiple choice question, but there can only be one answer. And um, it comes up as like a set of summaries. So every time you, it's a series of questions and every time you get a right answer, it adds it to the top. And then the next right answer gets added underneath that. So you're kind of building a full summary when you do statements. And I'll talk through these a little bit in more detail of their advantages and disadvantages in a moment. Um, this single choice set only allows one correct answer and it doesn't allow any feedback, which is why we're not choosing that one right now. What I'm gonna choose here is multiple choice, which I think is probably one of, one of the most powerful of the, of the ways of asking simple questions because it allows for um, explanatory feedback, which Dr. Brain um, talked about being the most effective. So when we click on this button here, it brings up um, an overlay where we're gonna make our question. You can see that up at the top, it says display time. And this is saying when it's gonna show our element. So you can have it show up as a pop-up button. Um, and we saw that in this video here. So this is the one we're making. I'm gonna show you what that pop-up would look like. So pop-up looks like something like this, where it's a button over the video and they'd have to click it to open up. In this case, it was just opening text, but you could click it and have it open a question. So that's what this button would do. Um, as Cynthia mentioned, it's best to force students to be answering most of our questions. So we're gonna be using the poster. And so what the poster is going to look like, I'm gonna go back and show you, is that it will be looking like this, where it's going over top of the video. You can make it cover the whole video or just a part. You get to choose the size, but it's layering on top of the video and asking them the question there. So that's what we're picking as poster. This is how long the poster is going to be displayed from what time, except that um, one thing to note is that if they're answering a question and they've answered it and they press continue, the poster will disappear. So you don't need to worry that it's displaying for 10 seconds here um, because it's gonna disappear once they've, they've done the question. So what I also recommend is it's automatically ticked when you click poster, but make sure that it says pause video because you want the video to stop and have students answer the question. You don't want the video underneath the poster to keep, to keep talking and talking uh, and continuing on with things that the student can't see. So now down here is where we actually are gonna put in our multiple choice question. Right here, the title is where we put in the title of our multiple choice question. You will be able to see this title. So think about this as being helpful for you to be able to see um, later on what the question was and maybe how you would search or organize within, um, within the back end. But the students aren't going to see the title of this question. So I could say this is a question about um, the, the second reactant. And that might help me remember what it's about. Now, in terms of what the question is, um, I'm gonna copy into the chat what the question is I'm putting in if you wanna put the same one and don't wanna need to type it. Um, I'm gonna say, 
The demonstrator indicates the isopropyl alcohol is a hydrocarbon. She notes that the hydrocarbon is the first reactant. What is the other reactant that is necessary that is already inside the vessel? So we can put in all different um, answer options here. So I'm going to put in and that maybe it could be N2 or it could be O2. And you can put in whatever you want. You'll see it's only automatically giving us two options. You just click this add option blue button to add as many different options as you want. So let's say heat and CO2. You can indicate which of these. Yeah, I can slow down. Okay, so I'll give you a moment to catch up here. So what I'm doing is just, I've so I've selected, I've said that I want that multiple choice question. I've put in a poster. I've added the title. That's just for you. And then you can put in the question and the different options. So it's also okay if you want to be just like practicing the functionality of it. You don't need to be writing out exactly what the question is if you just want to be you could write in placeholders too of like, this is the question um, if you don't want to take the time to write it all out if you're just wanting to practice the functionality. When you have all these different options, you can select as many as you want to be correct. And to get full credit, a student would need to select all of those. So in this case, you can just click um, O2 is our correct answer, but you could have more than one correct answer if you want to. For any option that you have, there is a possibility of adding extra information. So I'm going to show you what that looks like on one of these. So everything has this, every of these options in this multiple choice question has a tips and feedback. If you open that up by clicking the little arrow, you'll see that you can add tip text, message to display if the answer is selected, or a message that is displayed if it is not selected. And so what we could do here is the tip would be if it would give the user something to see about that answer before they try the answer. The message displayed if selected is after they press submit. If they do select that answer, it gives them feedback based on that. And you could also choose to give them feedback based on if they don't select that answer. I find that generally the default that I will most likely use is what I want to tell the student if they selected a particular answer. So it's usually this message displayed if answer is selected that I would use um, to give kind of traditional feedback on a particular answer. So I'm going to copy paste out just to make it, uh, I'm going to copy paste out what the feedback is that I would be giving students here. You can give, as I said, generic feedback, just saying like feedback test, or you can copy out um, a particular set of feedback. So I'm going to do this for each different option is to put a message displayed for if the answer is selected. For O2, we want to tell the students about how they are correct. So I'm going to say, yes, you're right. This is what it is. For heat, I'm going to give some feedback as well. So a student thinking that heat is a chemical would be wrong. So I want to give them some feedback on that. And I'm, gonna, I'm going through this part quickly because the chemistry is not the important part here. Um, and I will give them some feedback on if they pick CO2. That is not a reactant, but it is a product. So once you've put in any feedback that you want to give the students and you've gotten all the ones that you want, you've finished your question, you can click done up at the top. You can adjust when it's displayed if you want, if you want to adjust that a little bit, or you can leave it as it is. So we're going to click done up at the top here. And then you see that our video comes back where it now has this little dot. That little dot shows you that you have an interactive question there at that timestamp of your video at 23 seconds and it has displayed this poster on top. You can drag this poster anywhere you want and you can resize it however you want. So sometimes you might want students to still be able to see the video, for example. So you might wanna maybe like put, the, put it off on the side, but you can see for this particular question, they'd have to scroll a little bit and I don't really want them to have to do that. And that's not really important for them to see the video. So I'm gonna make it the full size. So you could make it whatever size you want. Okay, now, that we have got our question in there, 
we just have a couple more things to do in order to get this made. So up at the top here, oh, I see, because I started this again. I haven't put my title in for the overall thing. So I'm going to say that this is my combustion video. And what we can do now before we create the question is just put in um, a few things that are going to help um, us find our videos again, for us to keep track of what we've gotten, organize our question library in case you're making loss. And also if you choose to share them to help other people find your content. So one thing you can do is click this little metadata tag up here and you can see it should automatically have the title um, and your name as the author. And then um, it automatically is put the license as attribution. So you can though choose which license you would want, whether you want a Creative Commons license or not. And then you can just close uh, out of this by clicking Save Metadata at the top. And then the other parts that you can do is down at the bottom, you'll see that it's automatically going to say the faculty that you're part of. Again, this is for helping it be um, more easy to discover later. If you want to do these steps, your video is still going to work without these steps, but it does help organization. So I'm going to put in that it's a chemistry video. So I'm adding a discipline. The group is not, avail uh, is not available for this particular one. And then the other piece of it, piece of information you can choose are up at the top right here. So you can add tags. So for example, I'm going to add the tag H5P symposium so that I remember what I was making this question for. Um, we could also though do that it's a combustion reaction. Oh, I see a question about what happens if the YouTube video is taken down. It would disappear. Um, so that it is not copying the MP4, it is taking the link. So YouTube is still posting, uh, is still hosting the video. So that's why, depending on where you're at, for example, if you're at UBC, you could do it on um, on to Kaltura, or depending on where you have H5P, if, for example, you have your own instance, you can also upload that direct MP4 to it. Um, the UBC instant, the UBC tool um, is instead push is instead having you share the video via YouTube or Kaltura so that we're using the bandwidth of streaming the video from something that is set up to be streaming that video well to be able to be prepared to have lots of students using it at once. And then over here you see that there's these display options. And so I'm going to go back to the video over here quickly. So I'm just going to cap it. You can see that it's got these little um, at the bottom of the element, it's got these little buttons, reuse, rights of use, and embed. And so this goes around your H5P ele uh, element that you're making, but you can choose whether you want those things to be there. So you can say whether you want to display that little toolbar at all, whether you want other people to be able to download your content or not, whether you want them to be able to embed it or not, and whether you want to display copyright or not. An important thing for if you're making it using this UBC tool is you're going to have to put it somewhere. So you're going to need to embed it yourself. So at least at the beginning, you need to have at a minimum this display embed button so that you yourself can get the embed code. And then you could remove it later if you don't want anyone else to embed it. Okay, so I'm gonna keep all of these display options on so that anyone can use and share this as they want. And I'm going to click create up at the top. You could also have gone to any other point in the video and added any other interactions you want. You could add lots of questions. You could um, do these summary tasks at the end, add different types of questions. But for now, I'm just going to click Create. OK, so now that we have made a basic interactive video, we can try to put it in a course. And you're going to be able to put it wherever you want. So you would click this Embed button. If it's not there, it's because um, you didn't include the toolbox with Embed checked. But so you can go back and do that. So you click embed. You get the embed code here for the iframe that you can just copy and paste. And then I'm going to go to my um, test page over here on Canvas. And I'm just going to edit the page. And in Canvas, you would just do as you would for any embed, where you'd say insert embed and paste your embed code and submit. And now when I save it, 
we have our interactive video here within Canvas. So you can see it's got the interaction that we added right there. We can check what happens when they get the wrong answer. They get some feedback. They can try again. And then once they get the right answer, it gives them their points at the bottom and they can continue on. So I'm just gonna cap it. And notice that once you got the right answer, the poster disappeared right away. So it's not overlying the video um, once they've proceeded there. Okay, I'm gonna continue on in the interest of time to um, make sure that we also get to see some of these more um, advanced interactions. And so this next set, we're gonna show you a video rather than one where we just found it off the internet or made it previously without thinking about interactivity. This is a video that Simon and I worked on together where we were very intentionally making the video knowing we were gonna set up interactions within it and that we're going to use branching um, and hotspots, um, for example, in order to create the interactivity within the video. So I wanted to give a quick moment just of talking about the different types of questions that you can include and why we might wanna do this other version. Um, so we can do things like statements and single choice questions. You might have also seen that you can do other types of questions in the H5P video too. If you were exploring around, there's things like drag and drop with, with that you can do with pictures. You can do drag and drop words, fill in the blank. There's single choice, um, true and false, for example. And all of these questions, you, you'd be able to ask great questions for within your video. But one thing, um, that they can't do is give detailed feedback built within the question. So when we were just making the question with the multiple choice question, we had that text feedback based on what option they chose. You can't do that with most of the question types here. You can give correct, incorrect feedback, but built within the question type is not a place to give that feedback. So that's why we used the multiple choice version. But then uh, a nice thing that when you might want to use statements or single choice, is that you can do multiple questions in a row. So instead of asking one question and going back to the video, you could ask them like maybe three, four or five questions, just little questions in a row to check what, what um, they are understanding. So it might be helpful then. Something that the multiple choice questions can do that we didn't talk about was that if you um, want, you can have the video jump to a different spot or jump to a different link based on their overall result. So I'll show you where that is quickly. Um, if we go back to edit, and I'm going to my interactions again, and I'm going to the interaction itself and double clicking to edit it. If you were to scroll all the way down to the bottom, you'll see that there's some extra settings that you can adjust if you want that, that affect things like how the question happens, like do you randomize the answers or not? And there's also this one called adaptivity. So for adaptivity, you can say, if they get everything correct in this question, you should do this. So take them to a particular time code in the video, for example, or give them a message. Or if they get something wrong, you should instead go to this time point. So you can add branching using a multiple choice question, but that branching can only be on, did they get it all right? Or did they get it all wrong? And when we're asking a question, usually in a multiple choice, when there's other options, they might be associated with different misconceptions. So it might be that we want each different misconception to branch to a different part of the video. And we can't do that within multiple choice. It's just an overall branching of did they get it right or wrong. So that's where we have found the crossroads and the navigational hotspots to be quite effective. Because while these aren't technically questions, so they're not going to get a little one out of one, yay, you got it right. What they are going to get is that depending on exactly what they answer, it can branch to a different part of the video. And then the feedback and the right or wrong information is um, within that um, is within that chunk of the video that it has branched to. So here we're able to give a different branch for each option, which can then support detailed feedback. In the crossroads, you can put textual feedback in. And then in terms of the navigational hotspot, that detailed feedback you have to have thought about and put in your video initially, um, you don't build it in that part in, in H5P. So what we're going to do is work through how you would think about 
making a uh, branching interactive video, how you kind of how we've planned our videos, and then we'll try one out and see that it's maybe intimidating at first to uh, plan it, but then once you've got it down, it's actually quite quick to do an H5P. So here's what we have done in terms of our branching videos. We have some part of the, question, the, the video and it comes to question one, and then we organize our videos so that right after question one, we put a response to what we wanna tell them if they make error one, and then what we want to tell them if they make error two, et cetera. And we have all the little chunks of videos of what the feedback would be for each error directly after the question. And then the very last thing we do is give the response to what happens once they get it correct. And then moving on in the video, which eventually would go on to question two, and then all the errors about question two, et cetera. So a reminder quickly about which, um, which type of videos we're talking about here is that if we go back here, I showed you the nomenclature video where it's saying, for example, select the prefix and you're clicking over here. Great. There are four cards. These are invisible hotspots. So that's using a hotspot to be able to um, jump from one chunk of the video to the other. So if you were watching the timestamp here, you'd see that it's jumping to a different chunk depending on your answer. And then the sleep video that I showed here, this, what you see overlaid, this is the crossroads. And so depending on what you click here, it is jumping to a different part of the video as well. Okay, so those are the types of videos we're talking about are the ones like this, which uses branching, and the ones like this, and like this, which we're using invisible hotspots. Okay, so here is our or a very important tip is that H5P has reasonable precision for what time point you go to, but I found it most effective that when you're thinking about these different segments, include maybe a full second of blank space between each segment when you're making the video so that it's really easy to link into a time point without catching the tail end of a word or missing the beginning of a word um, in, your, in your time step. So I recommend leaving one or two seconds of blank space between each of these segments. Here is what Simon and the sleep video that um, Simon has in his psychology course, how we made it. So we have the first question coming in um, at zero minutes and 38 seconds is when it starts to talk about that question. And the question is, in which stage of sleep is the patient? And so what we have are all the different possible answers. And one of those is replay Preston's call. So, oh wait, I need to hear the information again before I answer that question. If they click that, the video will jump back to the beginning of the question segment. If they pick stage one, it's going to jump them to 48 seconds, where they're going to hear an explanation about why that answer is incorrect and get some feedback. Then at this little asterisk at 126, which is the end of this segment, we ask the same question again, but instead of replay the call, we say replay the explanation. Then if they do uh, another wrong answer, stage three, four, it's going to jump them to this time point, one minute 30, where we explain why that's wrong. Again, at the very end of that segment at one minute 59, we're gonna put in the question again so that they get to try again and ultimately get it right before they move on. If they do REM sleep or the patient is still awake, we didn't think people would pick these as much. We grouped the feedback into one video segment. So both of those options ultimately link to the same spot two minutes and two seconds. At the end of that segment at 2.29, we ask the question again. And if they answer correctly, stage two, it is the final one in our segment where it goes on and says, yes, you got it, that's stage two, and then starts on to the next question. Okay, so let's uh, start making this. So there's a raw video file is linked down here and that's what you're gonna need to be able to make this video on, um, on H5P. And this slide here has all the timings and all the wordings of anything that you'll be doing. So if you have access, if you're following along on the slides that are posted, um, keep referring back to this slide here. Okay, so I am going to open up H5P again, and I want to make a new question. So I am going to click add new here or add new at the top. 
Um, if you are still in your other video, you can still click it. It's still all right there. So I'm going to click add new. And just like before, I'm going to add an interactive video. Okay, so this time we're going to do things a little bit differently, which is we're going to add the video. But instead of being a YouTube link, I've done the Kaltura link. Down here, if you were getting your video from yourself from Kaltura, you'd put in the media ID. Because I have already done this part, you could click up here and just paste that link in that I gave up in the same as the YouTube link. So I got that by making it using the media ID earlier that I collected from my Kaltura video. So you should be able to click insert just like before and your video um, should be there. Okay, so once you've got your video in, click on add interactions just like before. So what this video looks like without any interactivity is quite long, it's 14 minutes. But keep in mind that a student isn't going to see all 14 minutes of this video. They're only going to see the parts that they need to see based on their understanding or misconceptions. OK, so what we're going to see if we watch through the video straight, it is just going to play with no pauses. Here's the question. Here's your feedback. Here's your feedback. Here's your feedback. And then it got it correct. So that's what this video would play through if we did it right now. The um, waves are sorry, the high for the sound. Maybe I will mute that so that we're not stuck with it here. Um, the first thing that we're going to want to do is put in this question. And the question should go in at 47 seconds. So I'm going to go back to that slide to show you where I'm getting that information. So every asterisk is where the question goes in. So the question gets asked by Preston around 47 seconds. So let's find that. Beeping. What does this mean? Okay, I'm pausing the video here. It doesn't matter if you get the timing perfect because you can adjust it later, but I'm pausing this here. He said, what does this mean? And we want to have the student be the person answering this question. Up at the top, we're picking the crossroads. So click on crossroads and it's going to be similar to the multiple choice here where we're gonna put in a question and different answers. But instead of having an answer and feedback, we're gonna say go to. So where in the video does it jump to? if that's their answer. It's going to take us a little bit to make this first question, but you're going to see that once we make it once, we can copy paste it to all those different locations. So our question is, in which stage of sleep is the patient? And our options are that either we want them to be able to replay Preston's call if they're feeling like, wait a minute, I need to watch that again. And I'm putting in the timestamp of 38 seconds because that's when that chunk of video starts. We could put in stage one, and that chunk of feedback starts at 048. You can put in decimals if you need to be more specific for your video. We could put in stage two. That's the correct one, and that would go to 2 minutes 33. I'm getting all of this from that same diagram that I showed. We could put in stage three slash four, and then I'd want that to go to 1 minute 30. They could be in REM sleep or awake, and both of those are going to go to the same two minute, two second option, but I'll put them in separately. Now in each of these, it says if chosen text, so you can give them text-based feedback based on a particular thing before it jumps to the video, uh, to the spot in the video where you've said go to, it would give them this little text and then they press continue and, um, and then they would continue on to the jump. So what I'm going to do is for when they get it correct is say, yes, um, take a moment to explain to yourself why this is stage two sleep. Or you could give them an explanation of why it's true. Okay, so we have put in our question at the top. 
we put in each of our different options and for each option we're saying where we want it to go to and as an option you could put in text that would then pause and make them press continue and read the text before they continue on one thing that we'll want to keep in mind for this one that was less important last time is the display time at the top i know that once i get to 48 seconds that's the start of my stage one explanation. And I don't want someone to jump to 48 seconds with that feedback and get this question again right away. I need this question to be gone by 48 seconds. So at the top here, I don't want it to last very long at all. I want it to last maybe to like 47.8. So this question is only gonna last for half a second up there, but the video is pausing while it's up. So I would recommend having a small display time. Okay, so now I'm going to click done. So you can see just like before we get this box in the middle and it's not in in particular place, we have to put it where we want it. So I'm going to drag it over. And I need the student to still be able to see what Preston's looking at. So that's what he's asking about. We need that image. So I'm going to make this just on the right side of the video rather than the whole video like before so that they can still see the image underneath. Okay, now that we have this element, you can copy and paste it to all the different places we need. So I'm just going to pull up that image again. We want this same question to come up at the end of every feedback statement stage, um, sorry, feedback section, so that the student has to answer the question again. So we want it again at 1 minute 26, 159, and 229. So what I will do is, I'm going to click on this and there's all these different options up at the top. And what I want to do is press copy. Then I'm going to go to one minute 26 where I know I want the video. Or I got to one minute 29 and I don't really want to keep scrubbing. You can also just click paste. So that's up at the top right here. I'm going to click paste. And then I'm going to double click to edit it. And I actually wanted it at 26 seconds. So I'm just changing this to 26 instead of 29 and pressing done. And it has popped it back to 26 seconds, just where we wanted it. You can do the same thing again without copying again, just press paste. And the next one we wanted it at was at 159 seconds. So I'm gonna change this to 159. and done. And then the last place was at 229. So I'm gonna maybe for this one try to scrub there. Play for it's a couple consistent seconds. with the observed EEG. Okay, so now I'm gonna paste and it's all set because I scrubbed to the right time. So our question now is linking all to the right spots the only thing that we'd want to adjust here, which I don't think I'll take the time to do here, is that all of these say replay play Pres Preston's call. What we do instead is say replay the explanation and change the timestamp for that one to just replay instead of the call at the beginning to play. Um, so for the, when the question is asked here, we want it to replay this segment. So we'd put in 202 rather than replay Pre Preston's call, which replays 38 seconds. Okay, now we should be able to create this. Um, you could adjust the metadata, the tags, the parts at the bottom. Um, I'm going to put in just a tag of H5P symposium. And save the licensing. And I'm going to create. Okay, so we have our element now, and we can just check the interactivity. So I can try pressing the stage one. When we're awake and alert, and it's going right where I want, and I can check when I press stage two, that it gives me that little, instead of just jumping to where I wanted, um, it first gives me that text feedback of, yep, you got it right, think about it, and they have to press continue to jump to the okay. next spot. Okay, stage two. So you can see that we've just really had to make the question once and then 
copy paste. And that question is not as complex as it first feels, though definitely still complex. So the tricky part is just when you're planning out your video, you have to think, what are all the different reasons someone might get this wrong that I want to reply to? And you don't have to reply to everyone. You could just have feedback for the most important ones that students get wrong most. And then just ask them the question again, copy paste that same question every time at the end of each segment. And then you can continue on with asking them the rest of the questions. Okay, does anyone have, I guess the, the last thing is that sometimes in this sort of section is that sometimes you have the type of question like I do in chemistry where it's more about images and I don't really want that text-based stuff because I can't ask the question I wanna ask in chemistry with text often as well for organic chemistry, which is why I use the hotspots. And you can use a very similar idea with the hotspots. So instead of doing the branching um, scenario, sorry, the branching with this crossroads, you can do branching with the hotspots. So I'm gonna come ahead to, we're gonna sit here and add a navigational hotspot, and we're gonna decide whether we want to answer Preston's call at all. So if Preston says, um, if we want to answer, then we will jump to um, 38 seconds, which is where Preston asks his question. And if he, uh, if they answer, uh, the other one, the, the like, no, I don't want to answer, we can make it jump to the end of the video. So all I've done here is I've said where I want the, um, when, how long I want it to display for. We don't need this to display for very long, maybe like a second or two. So I'll just display it for a second, but I want to pause the video because I want to make the user stop and click. Are you going to answer Preston's call or not? So I've said how long I want the hotspot to be there and that I want the video to pause. But you could just have the hotspot sitting there while the video goes on too. I've said where I want the time code to go when someone clicks it, but you can also make it go to a URL like another page or something. Down here, you can pick what shape you want it to be. You can pick the color you want it to be. I'm making it invisible so that it just looks uh, really smooth within the video. But if you want to highlight that there's a hotspot there, you could give it a color. And then, you can give an alternate text here. So um, I'm gonna say answer call, so that if someone's using, uh, some, if they're visually impaired and using like a, a read speaker or something that it will be able to tell them that. I'm gonna say done. And here is our thing. So I'm gonna, oops, I accidentally double clicked. So I'm just gonna resize that and put it over the part of the video that I want to be clickable. And now, when the video plays, it's gonna pause and ask whether or not you want to answer Preston's call. And you could put different hotspots over different elements that would jump to different spots or do different things. I'm gonna stop here so that we have time for um, our last 10 minutes of, of comments. So I'm just gonna update here and show what that functionality would look like. So let's see how this looks now. Okay, the, the video is pausing now. I've only added one hotspot. You can see that nothing happens when I go over that spot, except that I now have this clicking hand and like instead of the um, arrow, it's the hand, but you could make it visible if you want. So um, I'm if I click there, it's gonna, it would continue on in the video. Um, I think I have not got the timing quite right, which is why it's paused. I think I accidentally linked it to before before the hotspot. So it's linked us back, it's looped us back into the hotspot. I need to move that around and tweak it a little bit to get the right timing right. But I can press play and it will uh, hey. Okay, so now our last thing that I wanted to talk about in this session, um, I'm gonna take about five more minutes just because we started about 10 minutes late, um, is that our goal three was what other types of interactions could we do that would help Im help implement more of those best practices that Dr. Brain mentioned? So she spoke about how students often have cognitive overload. So how can we help manage the cognitive load? So decreasing intrinsic, uh, helping manage intrinsic load, decrease extraneous load, 
and support germane load, the necessary cognitive effort to learn what we want them to learn. And she mentioned three of these things about signaling or cueing the important things. She talked about segmenting, so having these smaller chunks. And she also spoke about weeding, where we would be taking out the unimportant information. So I wanted to give um, a brief overview of some ways that I thought of where H5P could maybe um, contribute to some of these, helping with some of these things. So for signaling, it involves cueing and highlighting important information to help students know it would decrease intrinsic load by helping students know, pay attention to this, this is the important part. On your toolbar bar in H5P, this is for labeling things, and this is for adding text here. Um, and I would see it being helpful if you are having a video where it's either someone else's video you're using, or it's your own video where you didn't add a signal or a cue where you would like to, um, that you could use these labels or text to overlay in the video to be able to show what the important part is. Or you could be adding a question using any of these elements here where you're helping the student pick out what the important information is. And that question would be cueing to them. What is the thing that they should be paying attention to and getting out of that information? Another thing that she mentioned was segmenting. So where it's really helpful to split up something into small chunks so that the user is taking on small chunks of information and that unlike right now, that they would have control over when proceeding to the next chunk. Um, and I could see this being helpful in H or uh, that you can do this in H5P by, for example, adding bookmarks. So something down here at the bottom of the play button. So off of the main toolbar, there's this little icon here, and this allows you to add chapter breaks. So I'll show you what that looks like. So when you are editing, it's just clicking on this button here, and then you would say add a bookmark, and it adds it right where you are at, where you're scrubbed to, and you would say what you wanted to um, note about the video. So I had that, for example, here, you can see that I can use that in this finished video to jump to, say, the actual combustion um, of, of this, this video. Another way that we could be breaking down segmenting is by adding questions, since that's segmenting the video into small chunks and giving them a chance to reflect. We can add text boxes and say that they need to, uh, with reflection prompts, and ask them to uh, click to continue so it gives a chance to pause and reflect. Um, and any of these elements, you can choose whether or not you want it to pause when you add that element of interactivity, and then they'd have to click to proceed. So all of those can help with segmenting the videos. The next thing that she spoke about was weeding, where we want to intentionally get rid of all the extra information. But Dr. Brain noted that sometimes there's information that you want to give to a more expert learner that would be extraneous for a novice learner. And so you can use H5P, for example, to perhaps use the pop-up option where something is optional, where a more advanced learner might want to seek out that in extra information. Or for example, Dr. Brain mentioned that if it was a differential equation that she wouldn't want to hear humor at that point. So maybe um, if a student, for example, in my chemistry class, we use calculus, but they're not required to know the calculus of it. So you could have a crossroads where you say, okay, do you want to see the calculus derivation or do you just want to skip to the final result and let the student have some control over whether for them that would be helpful to really understand where it comes from or whether that would be extra information that they don't um, want to overload themselves with. And then the branching that we just did in the video, um, in the psychology sleep video, was that we were giving each learner the information that they need when they need it based on their misconceptions. Rather than giving them all the information about every different thing, we were seeing where they were at and giving them information as they needed it as it, as it was relevant. Another thing um, that Dr. Brim touches on in, she didn't talk about it as much today, but does talk about it in a lot of her publications is student engagement. And a lot of these things are based on how the video was made initially. So it should be kept relatively short, conversational style, and be speaking relatively quickly with enthusiasm. One of the things she does speak about in her publications though, about student engagement that we can use H5P for is rather than just the baseline of how we make our videos, is that she that they found that um, 
using a video and having it make it feel like it's for these students in this course helps students be much more engaged in material. So we can do that, for example, by adding an overlay at the beginning, like a text poster that gives some context at the beginning of the video that says for these particular students, why this video is important, how it connects to what they're doing in the course. You can use the same video base video that you've made, but change up what the questions are, the difficulty of them, or what sort of things you focus on, depending on what particular group you're releasing the video to. Um, and in general, we found in our research that when we use that branching style of video that we just did, rather than the more simple multiple choice only, that students report that they find those videos that they feel much more personal for them. And Simon will speak more about that in the feedback session tomorrow. The last part is looking at active learning. Um, and Dr. Brain did touch on this a lot in terms of adding questions in. So we can integrate questions into videos, guiding questions at the beginning can really improve engagement, and then just adding any features that give students control. And H5P can do all of these things. So we can use any of these different question types to add interactive questions. We focused on the ones that allow us to give the best feedback possible, and Simon will speak more about that tomorrow. We can also use a text overlay at the beginning to add guiding questions, which is, or, and a summary at the end that touches on them. Um, and we can use the chapters, crossroads, and hotspots that jump to different parts of the video to help students have control of the navigation. So I'm just gonna look at quickly how I've used those guiding questions um, in the demo that we saw at the beginning. So this one here, for example, I added this text overlay in Canvas where it gives them questions to think about. And so they press play once they've read them. And then I added at the end a summary quiz that asks them um, answers to each of those questions. Um, so where it's a summary and they make sure that they've gotten the answers to each of those. So that brings us to the end of our 90 minutes with our with our 10 minutes uh, short, uh, our 10 minute late start. So I'm going to stop there.